Image family, good morning. Hope you're doing well. Listen, if you're a guest with us, I'd love the chance to be able to meet you off to my right, your left at starting point right after our gathering. Hey, listen, um, real quick as we jump in, I wanted to celebrate something with you. Um, Several weeks ago, we did something called Compassion Sunday, which is part of who we are as a church. We do it each year. We set aside a Sunday and we talk about how we want to be about the nations. And you all responded incredibly well. We had 30 kids that were sponsored by our church two weeks ago. So yes, celebrate that, but it gets even better. That puts our total at right at 80 kids that we sponsor as a church together, which is absolutely amazing. So now you can celebrate that because that is great news. That's 80 kids that have been rescued from poverty in Jesus' name because of your faithfulness. And I'm excited for what God's going to do and how we continue that partnership in the days ahead. Well, listen, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. As you're turning there... um, my buddy and I, when uh, we were in college, um, we had a unique situation. He um, had self-diagnosed himself with severe case of athlete's foot. And um, so when he got this, it was like really annoying and it lasted for a really long time. And so uh, we kind of come together and we're like, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to figure this thing out. You know, we're, we're going to find the right remedy. Now, mind you, in college, we had access to some of the greatest doctors in the state of North Carolina that were on call 24-7. We had an athletic trainer that literally was like a second mom that would come to the house and hold your hand if you were sick at night, okay? Like we had access to all of this that was a phone call away. But for whatever reason, we thought athlete's foot, we got this, right? So along the way, one of us had heard, probably me, I'll just take credit for it, that household bleach was something that would cure athlete's foot. And so we say, all right, we're going to do it. This is the thing. This is how you cure it. And so we take paper towels, we soak them in household bleach, and we wrap them around his foot. And then to make sure that we sealed it in really good, we took saran wrap, and we saran wrapped all of that on top of his foot to make sure all that could really soak in well. And so it goes on his foot, and about five minutes in, he's like, man, this is really starting to sting. This is kind of hurting, you know? And I'm like, bro, you got to man up. This just means that it's working well, okay? So it's burning off the fungus. So hang in there. So he hangs in there for about 45 minutes. And uh, so after 45 minutes, he's like, bro, I can't take this anymore. I need to take this off my foot. I'm like, all right, pansy, take it off your foot, you know? So he takes it off and pretty quickly we realize there is a significant problem because his foot is beet red. It is red as a lobster that's been cooked, okay? Like it is so red and he's like, it's sort of the touch and it's kind of hard to walk on. And so at this point we're like, okay, we got to call the athletic trainer. So we call Terry Joe. That was our athletic trainer. Terry Joe, hey, listen, you know, my buddy had athlete's foot and this is what we did. And she was like, you did what? Are you serious? What were you thinking? You need to get in immediately. So he gets in immediately, goes to the team doctor and meets with him. Turns out he has a first degree burn all over his foot. And uh, for about the next three years, he suffered from discoloration in that specific foot, all because of our home remedy, okay? Listen, you're like, why did you do that? I don't know. My brain wasn't fully developed yet, neither was his, okay? We were under 23. So that is partly my excuse. I don't know why we did it, but, but at the heart of it, really, why we did it was we wanted to fix his athlete's foot. We just did it in a very dumb way. See, the thing is, is that he, he had like a legitimate issue and, and we just thought, well, no problem. We'll, we'll fix that issue. We'll take care of it. And household bleach, that is the cure. By the way, it's not. Okay, that's an application for the sermon today. A household bleach is not a fix for athletes. But okay, I just want to make sure I'm on record saying that. But my buddy had a problem, right? His foot was bothering him. He had athlete's foot and, and we wanted to get rid of it. And rather than turning to the right people to get the help and healing that he needed, we turned to ourselves and said, we got this. And y'all, the reality is we do the exact same thing spiritually. We do the exact same thing. We operate under the same logic spiritually. And just like how me and my buddy, we made things worse. So often that's the case for us spiritually when it comes to our efforts and our ability and our desires to try to fix things. This is where Paul's going to take us this morning. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 is where we're going to pick up. He says this, tell me, you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? Now, Paul's here. What is he talking about? Well, 
What Paul's doing here at the end of chapter four is Paul's gonna go back to Abraham here in just a second. That's been his go-to example, right? He's used that from the beginning. He's kind of gone back to Abraham, back to Abraham, back to Abraham. So he's about to go to Abraham again, but he's gonna do this and he's gonna hold up another part of the story, another part of Abraham's story. And he's gonna do it to illustrate the mistake that these people are doing, that they're making in the midst of this. And so we're gonna watch Paul go back to highlighting Abraham and he's gonna use that as a very specific example to show the Galatians, y'all look, this is the same mistake that you're making. So he jumps in in verse 22. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born as a result of the flesh, while the other one born of a free woman was born through the promise. Now, keep in mind, as we're navigating through this, there's a group of people in the region of Galatia called the Judaizers that are holding up the law as a means of salvation. And they're saying, Jesus is awesome, but the law is equivalent. You need both. And if you can adhere to the law, then what you can ultimately do is find the transformation and salvation that you ultimately are looking for and that you ultimately need. And Paul's been building this case saying, nah, that's not the case. That's not how this thing works. You're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And he's began to hit this from multiple different angles. And he's, he's kind of coming to the, the end in a lot of ways of this specific nail that he's been driving as it relates to the law. He brings Abraham back up and he says, I'm going to give you an illustration to really make this clear to you, to make it really, really clear to you. And if you remember the story about Abraham, right? God comes to a guy named Abraham. He didn't come to Abraham for any other reason other than God chooses to choose Abraham as a means by which to father a generation and a nation that would be the means by which God would reveal himself to the world. So there's nothing special about Abraham. God just chose him as a means by which to reveal himself to the world. And so God comes to a guy named Abraham. He's about 75 years old. And there's this really powerful moment where God's like, hey, listen, Abe, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do some incredible things to you. Your descendants are going to outnumber the stars in the sky and the sand on the beach. And I'm going to do some amazing things through you. And Abraham's like, man, that's awesome. Only problem, God, is uh, I can't have kids. My wife and I are old. So how's that going to happen? God's like, hey, no problem. I'll give you a kid. That's on me. I'll take care of that. But what God doesn't say in the midst of this is when he will give that kid. So 15 years later, we have a problem. There's still no kid. And so what happens? Well, Sarah comes to Abraham and he says, hey, babe, listen, I got an idea. I know that God said that we were going to have this generational offspring that was going to be this nation and outnumber all the sand on the shore and the stars in the sky. Hey, here's the deal. It's been 15 years. I'm not pregnant yet, but I got this idea. I've got a maidservant. She's perfectly primed and ready to be able to have kids. She's at a place where she's capable of having kids. I think you should sleep to her. And maybe, maybe that we can establish this line through her, through Hagar, my maidservant, Sarah says, through her, I can build a family in Genesis chapter 16. And so Abraham being the great Christian that he is, has no pushback. We see the depths of his part, the depths of his problem. And the fact that he's like, all right, babe, no problem. I I like the idea, right? Abe just goes right along with the entire process. And so Abraham sleeps with Hagar and she gets pregnant. And Hagar gives birth to a son named Ishmael. And as you can imagine, this just doesn't go well in the household. It doesn't go well because Sarah ends up despising her. Why? Sarah's jealous of her. There's this tension between them. It's like, well, she got pregnant and I didn't. And what does all this mean? And Sarah ends up running Hagar and Ishmael off. And so here we are again, Sarah and Abraham and no kids. Fast forward about nine years and God comes to Abraham and he renews his covenant with him. He reaffirms that they will have a child in Genesis 17. And after this, God orchestrates the miracle that he had promised, and Sarah becomes pregnant. When Abraham, by the way, is 100 years old, 100 years old, and Sarah gives birth to a son named Isaac, 25 years, and then God comes through on his promise. Here's the point. Sarah and Abraham, they tried to accomplish in the flesh what only God could accomplish through his promise. This is what Paul wants to remind them of. In other words, they tried to manufacture something that only God could produce. They said, God, I got this. We'll figure this thing out. Hey, I know you made a promise, but man, we got it in our own efforts. We can do this thing. Sarah had been barren, and she tried to become fruitful by having Abraham marry Hagar. This failed and brought only trouble. The law could not bring life or give life fruitfulness. This is what Paul wants them to see. And y'all listen, the same is true for you and for me. 
The same is true when it comes to our salvation, but also our sanctification. Let me tell you what I mean by that. When we talk about salvation, this is you being saved from your sin. Becoming a son or a daughter of God. We were separated from God because of our sin. But God chooses to lavish us with his love by demonstrating it for us that while we were sinners, he died for us. And so our salvation doesn't come through the works of the law. We've talked about this week after week after week. So we're saved not by works, but through faith. We're saved through faith in the finished work of Jesus. It's, we're not saved based off of our works. The same is true when it comes to our sanctification. Sanctification is just a fancy word for the change that happens in our life. And the way that we see change happen in our life is not by works, but it's through faith in the finished work of Jesus. And so this idea of being faith-driven, not works-driven, is not only in our salvation, but also in our spiritual growth and the changes and transformation that we so often want to see in our life. The problem is, is we don't apply it there. Oftentimes what we do is it's like, yeah, I kind of get it when it comes to my salvation, but when it comes to my sanctification, the changes I want to see happen, that's on me. That's on me. But what the gospel shows us is that the salvation that we need and the change that we want to see and that we need doesn't happen based on our efforts or our work. It happens based off Jesus. And it's when we lean in in faith that we begin to see that happen in our life. So, so here's the question. Here's the question that I want you to wrestle with this morning. What is it that you're trying to accomplish in your own efforts? What is it right now that you're trying to accomplish in your own efforts? For some of you, it may be your salvation. That you grew up in a context or in a religion that continued to point you to the works that you have to do in order to be saved. Or that it was a one-for-one, one. like it's kind of like the Judaizers, it's faith in Jesus and it's works. And if you do both of these things, then you're pretty good to go, and we'll go from there. For, for some of you, what you're trying to see happen, the changes that you want to see is, is your salvation. You're hoping, you're hoping that you're actually saved. And so you walked in here, and that's one of the things that you're carrying, that you want to accomplish your salvation. You may not say that, but functionally you're living that way, particularly if you wrestle with guilt and shame so often. If you're bound by guilt and shame, that just shows you that at heart, you're really a legalist. Because when we understand the gospel, we understand Romans 8, 1, that there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So there is no place for guilt and shame as a Christian. For others of you, there's changes that you want to see happen in your life. There's transformation that you're desperate for, that you want to see. There's things that you want to be freed from. There's things that you're in bondage to. There's sin in your life that you want to see abolished. There's things that you're dealing with and you want to see change. You want to see that marriage better. You want to see that relationship with your kids better. You want to see that addiction gone. You want to see these things in your life change, but you're looking to yourself to be the one to change it. And the problem is, listen to me, you don't have the power to be able to bring about that change in you. If you did, then you'd be God. Yet so often we function this way. God, I get you, but I don't really get you. Because if I'm honest, I'm relying on myself to manufacture the changes that I want to see happen in my life. I'm looking at my efforts and my ability, and I'm constantly frustrated at myself. I constantly don't feel good enough as opposed to looking to you and beholding you. Where do you need to trust God this morning? Where do you need to trust God this morning? What is it that you need to give to the Lord this morning? What is that thing that you want to see change that you've been trying to change, but you can't change that you need to come this morning and say, Jesus, it's yours. Jesus, it's yours. I heard a story this past week, actually, about one of our um, church members that was in a situation where he had a massive need, and that need was frustrating, and it had burdened him, and, and he had been kind of working toward it and trying to conquer it all in his own efforts, and he kind of came to this place where he was like, you know what, pulled in his drive when he said, God, it's all yours. This is your problem. You're going to have to fix it. Next day, somebody from our church walks up and says, God told me to come to you and fix that problem that you've been talking about. What do we learn from that? We learn that oftentimes God's waiting for us to hand it to him to do the work that we ultimately need. But so often, what do we do? We hold on. We hold on, we hold on, we hold on. And what God is saying is give it to me in faith. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. Where is it that you want to see change? Where is it that you need to trust God this morning? Salvation and transformation, they both happen by looking to Jesus. 
where we anchor our trust in him. Verse 24, Paul says this. These things are being taken figuratively. Now, Paul's about to go into applying this specific example that he's given, and he's saying, I'm about to use what happened as a specific symbolic illustration of faith and works. He's talking about Hagar, and he's talking about Sarah. And he's going to take this a little bit deeper, but he says, I'm taking it figuratively. I want you to understand this is a great symbolic example of what I'm about to say next. And here's why this is such a great example. It's a great example because Abraham had a choice. In all of this, he had a choice. He could either have faith in himself to produce the offspring necessary through Hagar, or he could choose to have faith in God and choose to believe that God was going to be faithful to his promises. Either way, Abraham's exercising faith, right? The question is, where is that faith faith contingent? Who is that faith contingent on? It's either going to be on himself or it's going to be on God. What did Abraham do? He chose to put his faith in his own efforts, and it made a hard situation even worse. They went from struggling with infertility and barrenness to dealing with bitterness that destroyed their family and made things really, really hard at home. And so... Paul says, this is going to be an example for us to be able to examine. When we look back at that story, there's some beautiful things that we need to see today. And he's going to begin to hold those things up very specifically. He says this, for the women represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Now, I know for some of you, you're like, bro, what what does that mean? (laughs) That's a lot of words, and I hear a lot of things. What does that, what does that mean? Well, Paul actually, what he does here is he just punches them in the mouth one good time. He punches them pretty good here because what he does is he calls the Jews descendants of Hagar. In essence, he calls the Jews Arabs. He calls the Jews Arabs because his point is, if you think that works of the law play a part in your salvation, then Hagar might as well be your mom because it was by works of the flesh that established her family and her line. So you want to play the game of works in the law, then Hagar might as well be your mom. And that's kind of a punch in the mouth from him because he says, but on Sarah, on the other hand, her son Isaac and his offspring weren't established by works of the flesh, but they were established by God and his promises. They were established by God. And so what Paul says is Hagar represents works of the law as a means of salvation. Sarah represents God's grace, that he's the one who established her offspring. And what Paul wants them to see is the beauty of God's grace in this. It's the beauty of of God's grace because God's grace is what established Jerusalem. And God's grace is what saves Jerusalem. See, when you look at Sarah's situation, what we see is a God that gives grace to a woman and a family that don't deserve it. Think about the story. God comes down and says, listen, here's all I'm going to do. Which, by the way, I know for some of us, we're like, man, if God just told me, then I would. No, you wouldn't. Look at Abraham and Sarah. God told them, literally, hey, I'm going to give you a kid. They're like, okay, 15 years later, ah, we got to figure this thing out, fix our own problem. They literally, in that moment, turned their backs on God and said, God, we know that you're God, kind of, but we feel like we need to take this into our own hands. They turned their backs on God. They did their own thing, and they produced an offspring by works of the flesh. And yet, God comes to them after that and says, I still love you. I'm still faithful. In fact, I will always be faithful even in the midst of your faithlessness. You were faithless. I will be faithful. That is God's grace. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. They did not deserve to have a kid after what they did. And yet God says, I'll give you one anyway, because this is not contingent on you and your performance. It's contingent on me and my promise. This is what Paul wants us to be able to see. This is a picture of God, what God would ultimately do through Jesus, is that our salvation wouldn't be contingent on our performance, it would be contingent on his promise that a deliverer would come to make all humanity right, that would fix that which was broken. See, the beauty of the promised deliverer, Jesus, in what he does is he comes and deals with the root cause that severed humanity from God to begin with. This is all about God's promise and nothing about our ability. It's our ability that got us into the problem that we have. So certainly our ability can't get us out. Paul's saying it's about faith, not about works. 
And this is what Paul says in verse 26. We keep reading. He says, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Here's his point. His point is that Sarah, Isaac's mom, being a free woman, stands for the heavenly Jerusalem. That is the Christian church. And as Christians, we're now citizens of the Jerusalem above. Peter would talk about this. We're citizens of a heavenly kingdom. This is what he's getting after. And we're bound to the living God by a new covenant. That new covenant comes through the blood of Jesus, not through the law. And this citizenship that we have access to, here's the beauty of it. It's not bondage, but freedom. It's not bondage, but freedom. We're free to be citizens of of heaven. Listen, here's, here's ultimately what he's driving at that I want to hold up for you. The beauty of Christianity is that it is not a religion of bondage. It's an offer of freedom to be in a relationship with God. It is not a religion of bondage. And y'all listen, this is where so many people miss so many conversations that I've had over and over again, where people think that Christianity is bondage, that it's a rule book. And here it is, follow the rules. And if you follow the rules, then maybe God will do this, that, and the other. And you find yourself in a place where you're constantly thinking, am I good enough? Did I do enough? Why isn't God's blessings being lavished on me? It's gotta be my problem. This is just bondage. It's walking around with chains because we're chained to our works. So many people assume that Christianity is about religion and rituals and rules. And so for them, Christianity is drudgery and God is a killjoy and they want nothing to do with it. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody wants to experience that kind of burdensome or or drudgery. Nobody wants that. Nobody desires that. Nobody thinks they can experience life or transformation from that. This is the miss, as opposed to seeing it as a beauty that you've been freed from something to someone. See, when you look at the law as a means of salvation or you're standing before God, you're enslaving your own self by your own works, which can accomplish nothing. Your attempt to work or to add anything, it just makes things worse, just like it did for Abraham and for Sarah. What it does is it does things like this. And we assume that our efforts play a part in our salvation. We assume that our efforts play a part in our transformation. All it does is mask the ultimate problem. Just mask the ultimate problem. We don't actually get to the root of the source. It it diminishes our motivation. Nobody's motivated when we see religion and rituals and rules. Nobody's motivated or compelled to to be at a gathering or be in community with one another or pick up the word of God and read. You're not motivated to those kind of things. You feel like every time I pick it up, it's going to tell me to do something. That's not what it's doing. This is not telling you to do something. It's telling you to behold someone. Over and over and over again, it says behold someone. It says you can't do anything. And that God came and did everything for you. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. If you want to be compelled, you've got to reframe how you view Christianity. It's not a burden that's been put on your back. It's a freedom that you've been saved into. Listen to the words of Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I feel like this is the trump card. Like, just listen to him. He says, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. No, listen, the call of Jesus is not work harder. It's not be a better person. It's come to me. Come to me. Rest in me. Y'all, if you're honest, some of you walked in here and you're exhausted because you have been working your fingers to the bone in hopes that you will hear God say, well done, or you will get that blessing that you've ultimately wanted. And this morning, you're exhausted. And some of you are even frustrated. You're frustrated at Christianity because you don't feel like it's produced the thing that you've wanted it to produce. And the problem is, through it all, we're missing. We're missing the call of Jesus, which is rest in me. The picture that we get is not a task-driven God but a loving and tender father that says, hey, come sit in my lap. Come here. Hey, you've been working like crazy. You've been spending so much time trying to do for me. I just want you to be with me. Because when you're with me, you see me for who I am and you know that I've done all the work. Son, daughter, 
Just sit in my presence. Know that it is finished. Well done. Well done. Not because of your efforts, but because of the efforts of Christ in your place. Jesus says, rest in me. He doesn't say work. He says, come to me. Come to me. For some of you, you just need to be recharged by that this morning. You need to be freed by that this morning. You need to understand that Christianity is not a religion of bondage. It's about a relationship with the God that made you. When you begin to see this, it changes everything. Because then we do begin to see freedom from the bondage of our sin and our inability to obey God. We see freedom from those things. And we actually enjoy Christianity. Yo, listen, Christianity is actually a joyful thing. I mean, if you remember David, right, like he danced buck naked through the streets, okay? I'm not recommending that, nor will we practice that here at Image Church, okay? But the point is, my man was wilding out because he really had joy because he understood who God was. Now, you talk about a guy who's an emotional basket case. The guy was a train wreck. Read the Psalms, okay? He's up, he's down. He's high, he's low. Like, emotional care, he got it. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was already on the soul care and processing through the whole deal. And yet, this is a guy that loved God, that saw it as a good thing. And it's time again that we kind of recalibrate, understanding that Christianity is a good thing. And it's something we can get excited about, and it's something we can sing about, and it's not something that we ho-hum and walk in bondage in, but it's something that we have been saved to and that we're lavished by, and we get a glimpse into the love of God that he's had for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. For some of you, you need to see that this morning. You need to rest in Jesus. Now, here's what Paul's going to do next. He's going to quote a song about Sarah, but it's from Isaiah 54. The scriptures are all woven together. I love this. Verse 27, he says this. For it is written, rejoice, childless woman, unable to give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate woman will be many more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. And so th this is what he ultimately does here, is he takes this song that's about Sarah that Isaiah uses to prophesy about Israel's changing fortunes. So Isaiah uses this, and he uses it for Israel to say, hey, listen, you're going to see a change in fortune, and I want you to be reminded of the faithfulness of God in that. Well, what, what Paul does is he drives this back, and he says, Sarah's change in for fortune doesn't come from her efforts. It comes from God. This is the point of why he brings this in. So he's kind of looking back to Israel and he's like, hey, remember God's faithfulness to you guys and the song that was used about Sarah then? Well, I just want to remind you that that same song is true, that Sarah's change in fortune, it didn't come through her works or her ability, but it came through the promise and faithfulness of God. And one of the things that we get to see here in the midst of this, something that we need to understand as we look at this kind of celebration of the turn in fortunes of Sarah that is established by God, and it's this. God is much better able to accomplish his promises than we are. God is much more able to do things that we can't do. God is much more able to accomplish things that we could never see or dream possible. Think about Sarah and Hagar for just a minute. One of the women, great potential. She was younger and she was in child rearing age. She was in birthing age where, where she could have children. The other one, long gone. She's in her 90s. Like, that ship had sailed, right? Like, you look at them and you go, at face value, one of them seems more qualified than the other one, right? Hagar seems way more qualified. And yet, who does God choose? He chooses Sarah, the unqualified. Why? Because in that, he makes his power most known. My mentor says it like this. The good news of the gospel is that God doesn't need any potential from you to work miracles in you. The good news of the gospel is that God doesn't need any potential from you in order to work miracles in you. See, the thing that I love about the God of the Bible is that so often he takes the least and lowly and most unqualified people and he uses them in some of the most significant ways for the sake of his own glory. Because at the end of the day, that's what God's after is his own glory. Zechariah says it like this, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God wants to work in us. He wants to use us, but he wants to do it to get the greatest degree of glory for himself. So what that means 
is that God can use you and that God can work in you and that God can accomplish his plan and his promises in you. And I know for a lot of you are like, but I don't have the potential. You don't know, I'm not that qualified. Like I got all these gaps and I've got all these problems and I've got all these things, but it's not about you. This is the beauty of the gospel. It's not about you. It's about Christ in you. It's about what Christ can do because he's in you. And so what that means is, listen to me, regardless of what you walked in here with, no matter how many jobs you've got fired from, no matter how many marriages that you've been in, no matter how many hardships that you've walked through, no matter what kind of addictions that you're experiencing, no matter what kind of bondage that's in your past, no matter what you walked in here with, God shows us that he can and will use you when you lean in in faith, that there's nobody too far gone and there's nobody too broken that God can't use, that God can't work in. Just look at Abraham and Sarah. You look at them and you're like, that's a jacked up couple. Like they're messed up. And God goes, that's exactly who I'm gonna use. Not only were there physical discrepancies in their ability to have kids, there's spiritual problems. There's emotional problems. There's all kind of problems that they've got. And God says, I wanna use them. And I'm not just going to use them in a small way. I'm going to use them in a massive way. Like, I'm going to come through their family line. That's how much I'm going to use them. And it's so easy oftentimes to walk in and feel like, yeah, this Christianity thing, I don't feel that qualified. I don't feel that good. And what God says and what God shows us this morning is it's not about you. It's about Christ in you. There's a story about a, a young lady named Mary Slessor. She was a Scottish missionary born in the 1800s. And she came from a really poverty-stricken background. She faced a lot of hardships. Her father was an alcoholic. And, and she had a lot of challenges growing up as a kid. But despite those challenges, she felt called to serve God as a missionary. She was inspired uh, by David Livingstone, um, kind of a, a big name there. And when she was 28 years old, she was sent to, to Nigeria to be a missionary, full-time missionary. She gets there. She learns the language. And you're talking about this, this little girl that's born, you know, way off in um, in Scotland, who finds herself in Nigeria. And she learns the language, she engulfs herself in the culture, and she begins to kind of figure this thing out. And, and she has these courageous efforts where she begins saving twins because they were trying to kill one of the twins off. And so she was adopting them and bringing them into her home. And, and her, her work went even beyond just rescuing children. It started there, but it didn't finish there. She started to establish um, opportunities for women's rights and education and health reforms. She established missions and schools and clinics and also uh, mediated a lot of disputes that happened throughout the country. She, she brought peace in troubled areas. Like she had a catalytic impact in Nigeria. And when you look at this, what you see full well is that Mary Slessor's life is a powerful testament to the idea that God can use anybody to accomplish his work. You've got this simple young lady from a humble beginning that seems underqualified, that God chooses to have a catalytic impact in Nigeria. For Mary, it was not about her. It was about Christ in her. Y'all, the same is true for us. It's not about us. It's about Christ in us. It's about actually leaning in and believing that, that if God can use people like Mary and God can use people like Abraham and God can use people like Paul, who used to be Saul, who killed and murdered people, that God can use you, that God can use you. Some of you need to be encouraged by that this morning. You need to be reminded by that, that again, the beauty of Christianity is that it's not about you, which means when it comes to God, using you. It's also not about you. Verse 28, Paul says this, now to you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise, but just then as the children born as a result of the flesh persecuted the one born as a result of the spirit, so now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of a slave, but of the free woman. Now, what Paul does here, just really quickly, is that he says that those that are trying to live under the law as a means of salvation, they will always be at odds with those who live, in, live by faith in God's promise. Those who try to say the law is a means of salvation will always be at odds with those who say faith alone in Christ alone. And these false teachers who are trying to implement the law in Galatia, who are trying to oppose the gospel, are evidence of that kind of opposition. We're looking at the rivalry then. 
We're looking at the rivalry take place as we're reading through this entire thing. And Paul's saying to the Galatians, drive out these people. These people are trying to add to the gospel. Drive them out. Get them out of the city. Because you're not saved by works of the law. You're saved by faith. You're no longer bound by the law. You've been set free through the promises of God that came to fruition through the finished work of Jesus, making you sons and making you heirs. Jesus has done everything necessary to save you. You are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Paul says, anything else, reject it. Reject it. Here's one of the powerful things and why I bring this up, though. Because this opposition that Paul talks about, we still see evidence of it today. Ishmael's descendants would become the sworn adversaries of Israel, continuing all the way to this day. In fact, Muslims around the world proudly claim that Ishmael is their spiritual father. And Islam is a religion that from the start to finish teaches that you are saved by works of the law. When I was in New York City, I was working with Muslims and and we would have conversations over and over again. And we would go to them, and it was something called Korbani uh, when we were there. And, and what it was was they, they actually go back to um, when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. And they would kind of reenact that moment. And so they would buy goats, and they would buy lambs, and they would kind of go through this moment. And, and they would say, as you're asking them, like, man, what is Korbani about? It's like the, the, it's about the mountain where Abraham goes up. But they will say to sacrifice Ishmael. Ishmael. They don't think Isaac is the actual dude. They're like, Ishmael's the guy. And they build their whole religion off of Ishmael. Proof of the evidence of scripture that the Bible says this would happen. Like we're literally looking at it today. At this rivalry that exists between those that believe in faith alone in Christ alone and those that believe in works of the law. And when you would talk to the Muslims, they would say this. You'd be like, man, well, how do you know you're right with God? And it's like, well, it's like a scale. You know, if we do enough good, hopefully it outweighs enough bad. And you're like, well, how do you know? It's like, well, we don't ever know. And I'm sitting here like, no, 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 you don't understand. You can know. You can know. There's this massive divide, this massive gap between these two parties, which, by the way, speaking of Muslims, you know that we have some of our very own that are in Kosovo in a Muslim country, unreached people group. We have the chance to be able to go visit them this fall. And we actually have an interest meeting this Sunday, today, right after our gathering for some of you. I mean, like this needs to be a next step for you because we're called to run into these places. We're called to run in like Paul and teach the truth of the gospel. And this is a chance to partner with our people that are there in a Muslim country doing just that, telling people about the finished work of Jesus, saying you can know for sure that you can be saved. Some of you need to come to that, that interest meeting, but this is the robbery that exists. And this is the challenge. This is what our missionaries face in Kosovo. There's this massive divide that still exists today as evidence of the truth and validity of God's word that was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So here's where Paul leaves us. He says, anyone who relies on obedience to the law, whether we're talking about the Judaizers in Paul's day, the Catholic church in Lutheran's day, Muslims in our day, or legalistic Christians in our own churches, that they will be, they will hate those who represent leaning into faith alone in Christ alone. They will hate those who solely rely on Jesus as a means of salvation. For some of you, you walk in here every week or or maybe you're here for the first time and you wonder why is it that the gospel is preached every single weekend? And the gospel just means the good news of Jesus, that Jesus was perfect in our place. He went to the cross as our punishment in our place, and he rose from the dead to give us everything that he did for us and that we're saved by faith in his finished work. And the reason why that's preached week after week after week is the application and the point is because all throughout the Bible over and over and over again, this is where we're pointed And I know oftentimes it's like, man, but I really love five ways to be a better husband and six ways to be a better college student and two ways to be better at my job. That's awesome. But none of those things change your standing before God. None of those things make you right before God. None of those things deal with what's at the core of who you are. And at our church, what we believe is that if you can get to the core of our problem, which is at our hearts, which happens through surrender and faith, that when you have a new heart change, you have a new life change. That the same power that saves you is the same power that transforms you. And that transformation process, which by the way, we're going to talk about next weekend, is the thing that actually makes you better at your job is the thing that actually makes you have a better marriage, which is the thing that actually makes you a better student. 
because you've dealt with the core of who you are. If we just give six steps apart from the heart of who we are, then, man, you've got something that masks the problem for a short time, but you have no long-term change. What the Bible shows us is that long-term change before God and in our lives happens through the finished work of Jesus. And I know for some of you, you grew up Catholic or you come from a super legalistic household. And so Christianity felt like a lot of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations and drudgery and frustration and not freeing and cumbersome. And what I want you to see this morning as your pastor is that is not what Christianity is. And that is not what Paul wants for the churches in Galatia or what God wants for you and I. This is why every single week we have to combat the natural tendency of our hearts, which is to look to what we can do and walk out beholding what God can do. This is the rivalry. Every day, every week, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves because our natural bend is to our efforts, what I can do, what I want to do, as opposed to who God is and what he's done and what he wants to do through you. Y'all, the power of Christianity is not in the rules. It's in the relationship that you have access to, through the finished work of Jesus. For some of you this morning, you need to believe that for the very first time. Like for some of you, you just got to see, and it may mean that you take a big step of trust, but you got to see that Christianity is a good thing. And it will actually give you what you actually need and ultimately what you've always longed for. You just hadn't been able to put your finger on it. For, for others of you, you've been at a place where you really think that your salvation and the transformation is contingent on you. And this morning, you need to surrender. I asked you the question earlier, what is it that you're trying to do in your own efforts? For some of you, you walked in and you're at war in your own efforts, trying to accomplish something that you don't have the power to accomplish. And this morning, for you, that means you need to come open-handed. For others of you, you need to take a next step in your faith. And it's this, for many of you. One of the ways that we're marked as a child of the promise is through baptism. Baptism is not something that saves you, but it's something that marks that you're saved. Paul's talked about this. Paul talks about this a lot. Jesus talks about this a lot. Jesus did this. Why? Why does it matter? It matters because... It's a public declaration where you go public with your faith saying, I am a new creation. I'm a child of the promise. I've placed my faith in Jesus. Baptism is less about you and more about him. See, every time we do a baptism, we're just reenacting the gospel. We say buried with Christ in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. And there's something about going public with your faith. I Man, it just matters because you're coming to the church saying, hold me accountable. I'm a new creation. The old's gone, the new's come. I want to declare that. Not only do I want to declare that, but I want to share that. I want the world to know. And I know for some of you, you're like, yeah, bro, but I got saved like 10 years ago. I just never have gotten baptized. Okay, take the step of obedience today. Why wait? It's not weird. It's not awkward. I've had multiple people. We've had lots of people in the life of our church. Like, man, I got saved like 10 years ago, and I never took steps of faith. I never took the step of obedience to be baptized, and I'm going to do that. I mean, we watch how God uses that, where they come up and they're like, hey, I'm a, I'm a new creation. I want to declare this publicly. I've never, I've never actually walked through believer's baptism, baptized by immersion after I've trusted in Jesus, after I've made my faith my own. And we watch as other people resonate with that, and they come up and they're like, man, I actually need to be baptized too. I want to go public with my faith. I and mean, for some of you, you need to do that. Or, or others of you, you need to really evaluate when you actually got saved. You know, a lot of times we hear the story where it's like, man, yeah, you know, I prayed a prayer, threw a stick in the fire, and there was a creek, and we just dunked and moved on, and, you know, and, but man, about five years later, like, I really got it, man. I just, you know, I really started to see change in my life. You know, before then, I really saw nothing, but, you know, that kind of counts for here. It's like, I mean, you got to get your, your story straight. See, this is what baptism also does, is it helps us hone in on our story. The Bible shows us that you were dead, and you've been made alive, that you were an old creation, and you become a new creation. You go from not having the spirit of the living God to having the spirit of the living God. Baptism helps be that marker and that indicator to show the time before Christ and the time after Christ. So for some of you, you got to really eval, did you really get saved 10 years ago or did you get saved like last year? Because we've walked this journey with a lot of people in our church. It's like, man, you know, if I'm honest, I really got saved about six months ago. Praise God. 
I told you before, I think there needs to be a revival of the saved. There's a lot of people walking around thinking they prayed a prayer and they've done the right thing. And, you know, they wrote their sins on a stone and threw it in the lake and whatever else they did. And it's like, that's not what makes you a Christian. This is the, the whole series, the whole thrust of Galatians. What makes you a Christian is when you have that moment where you say, I surrender all and all to him I owe. Sin had made a crimson stain and he washed me white as snow. For some of you, you've got to track back and say, when did I surrender to Christ? And have I gone public with my faith since? And if not, we want to walk with you on that journey. An exciting journey. So I want to challenge you to process and pray about what God's calling to you, calling you to next as a Christian. What are the steps of faithful obedience you need to take? Would you bow your heads with me for just a second? This morning, I want to cultivate some space here before we apply the sermon and the text through communion and just pray. For some of you, you walked in here and you're trying to do things in your own effort. And this morning, I want to cultivate space where you can just come forward and you can pray. Some of you need to come to the altar and you need to open your hands and you need to say, Jesus, I surrender. I trust you in this area. I have tried to hold on to this area on my own. I've, I've tried to do this all on my own. I've been working my fingers to the bone this morning. I'm exhausted and I give it to you. I'm sick of dealing with it. I'm tired of dealing with it. For some of you this morning, you need to come to the altar. You need to assume the posture of surrender and watch how God uses it in your heart. And you need to get on your knees and you need to say, whatever that thing is in your life that you've been trying to control, whatever that thing is in your life you're trying to hold on to, whatever that thing is in your life that you want to see change, you need to come to the altar this morning. You need to, with open hands, say, Jesus, I surrender that to you. You bring the change in me. For some of you, it might be declaring salvation for the first time. For others of you, it's a specific thing in your life. And the Spirit's pressing on it right now, and you need to give it up this morning. You need to let go and let God do his best work when you finally turn it over to him in trust. So I'd love for this space right here just to become an altar. We hit our knees, and we pray, and we say, Jesus, it's all yours. Everything in me. I want to surrender it all. God, I pray you do work in this place. I pray that you would allow us to anchor ourselves in prayer as we surrender and as we say, Jesus, you take it. There's so many of us I know that walked in here and we are carrying burdens that are not meant for us to carry. And you say, Jesus, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. In these next couple of moments, would we come weary and heavy laden and would we sit and rest at the feet of Jesus? Church family, you come here in just a minute. We're going to sing. You respond. And let's pray together.